This is the Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. Today, we are honored to have in the studio Mr. Erwin Ballarda. Uh, thank you, sir, for, for coming in today to chat with us. Uh, you know, I was looking at your bio and reading everything that I could find about you on the Internet, Wikipedia. You know you've made it when you have your own Wikipedia article, right? Yeah, but all lies, all lies. Did you know that was there? Uh, (laughs) There's only one word I can really come up with (laughs) to describe uh, Irwin, and that's badass. I hope that doesn't offend you at all. But it shouldn't uh, because uh, your skill set and the things that you've done are completely impressive. So thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, Trey. Irwin is a commissioned police officer, has been so for 31 years, uh, was with the Texas Department of Public Safety, uh, is retired, is now commissioned as a special ranger, That's great. Uh, is currently the executive director of the uh, Texas Police Association. Yes, sir. And uh, the rest of your background is quite uh, amazing, and I, I can't wait to get into it in depth. <laughs> and I know our, our audience is going to really enjoy uh, listening to you today. Uh, one of the things that you are currently doing today is you are the owner and founder of Armatech USA Security Group. So tell us a little bit about Armatech and what you do through Armatech. Through Armatech, what we do is um, we offer VIP protection. We also offer... Uh, private security and currently what we're doing is that uh, for we're doing security for gated communities and um, so we make sure that we have the the best personnel on on board uh, that uh, that we can that we can get and at the same time uh, we do a comprehensive security um, assessment and protocol and and training for the people involved Right, right. So I, I first uh, became acquainted with you and your services when I was at a charity event uh, at which you had s- very graciously offered up a self-defense class uh, as a live auction item. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, by the time your item rolled around, I had already blown my money on a, on a <laughs> private concert with Corey Morrow. So oh, I was thinking, wow. well, you know, How I was compare? thinking. <laughs> I, I could probably use the self-defense training uh, more than I, I need another concert in my life, but I love Corey. Yes. Um, but I was fascinated by what you do. Uh, I know after that uh, charity event, you you tra- did some training at a women's retreat. Is that something you do often? No, actually, okay. I, um, this is something I, I don't do, but it's something that I will do for good causes. Okay. CC4C is a wonderful organization. Absolutely. Um, so definitely on that and uh, if any other nonprofit that uh, I'm involved with. So CC4C is an interesting nonprofit that I had never heard of prior to this event. Uh, but a- as we all know, there are nonprofits and charities for kids with cancer, with people with Alzheimer's, various diseases. Uh, but up until this organization got founded, there was not a, an organization to support and care for children with rare and undiagnosed or misdiagnosed or hard to diagnose diseases. And so That's CC4C correct. is doing some really amazing things. Amazing stuff. Amazing How did stuff. you get involved? Well, you know, um, it's always a friend that brings you in there. <laughs> oh, what would we do without friends? With wonderful friends. That's I right. actually have a wonderful friend. His name is Tony Quintos. Uh, Tony was on the board for CC4C, and, uh, and apparently he asked, uh, he asked somebody to reach out to me and said, hey, use Irwin as an auction item. And, of course, I'm going... <laughs> I was just sold. (laughs) So, uh, but, you know, anything from my friend Tony. Sure. And then when I got to meet Talaya and what the cause was about, I said, you know, who can go wrong by by doing wonderful things for wonderful people and children in need? That's right. Very, very positive. Now, where where were you born and raised? Uh, Trey, I was born in the Philippines. Okay. Um, I was born um, uh, and actually raised there. I, I and um, but my father immigrated to uh, Canada and North America first, and then when you were how old? I would say about six, seven years old. Okay. And so I remember I was just kindergarten in in, in the Philippines, and then I ended up going to like f- first grade, and then we left. So that's that's about the time when we ended up going to Canada, where my father took a job as a as a maintenance person, and so anyways he ended up over there, and then. He saw an opportunity to go to the United States, and a world of opportunity in the sure. United States. And so, yeah, after the 1967 Detroit riot, he ended up uh, moving to Detroit, Michigan, where he worked for quite. That's a probably not why. 
<laughs> Probably not something the Chamber of Commerce was talking a lot about at the time. No, but, no. So there was a job with Chrysler that enticed him, and, and off, yes. off you go to Detroit. Yes. Uh, so did you graduate from high school in Detroit? Actually, no. <laughs> there was another move in Another there. move. Okay. So in between that one, Trey, is that I ended up, um, you know, in life we always try to find our calling and so on. And, I, and actually I thought that uh, priesthood was the direction. So I actually went to high school in Edgerton, Wisconsin, the Jesuit high school. Right. And uh, I thought priesthood was going to be my, my direction, and, um, but it wasn't. So, so a, couple, a couple things I'd love to dig, <laughs> dig into there. Uh, so you grew up Catholic. Yes. Okay. Um, and so what was the motivation to go to the Jesuit high school? I mean, were you a bad kid and your dad said, I'm sending you away? No. No? Okay. No. Okay. In fact, I wanted to go home after like the first week and go, I'm in the wrong place here. You know, it's so just, it was your idea? It was my idea because all my friends wanted to go. Oh, that, and so, okay. so like I got three okay. other friends and they're okay and I'm just missing my parents. I'm calling them. I said, can I go home? He goes, no, we can stick it out for that, you know, for a week. And if you're not, if, <laughs> at least a week, At least son. a week. And if you can't make it, then, you know, it ends up four years. Nice. Nice. So what was... Uh, obviously, joining the priesthood is an honorable calling, uh, certainly not an easy calling by any means. What was the, the point in time w in which you said, um, love God, love the church, but this is probably not for me? Yeah, I think by the time I was like the, f the early part of my senior year, I decided, you know what, um, committing to this one here and uh, into priesthood is not... But I'll let you know, um, because I, I, I researched quite a bit, and I talked to a lot of the priests, young priests, and, mm -hmm. and so laymen can, can be doing wonderful things outside of priesthood, Absolutely. to do wonderful things, and sure. to volunteer, and to do good causes. And so I um, actually ended up going to Eastern Michigan University, and I took up psychology and sociology, and I and uh, ended up actually counseling emotionally disturbed children. Mm. And I worked at halfway homes and uh, houses, and and actually, I, I feel that you know, um, you know, you, you may not know which direction in life, but you pray for it, and, and, right. and doors open, and you never know what impact you have, and and, and those things occur. And so I, I felt that still doing good. Sure, and that, that's the direction God directed you. Oh, and so. and, and you had a positive impact on a lot, a lot of young kids. Oh yes, right. Yeah. In fact, uh, this year uh, a young young man, or not young man, an older man, he was a young man then, Right. called or messaged me on social media and says, hey, uh, would you be my friend? And I said, you know, I said, I said, my name is Frank. I said, I only know this Frank so-and-so. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he goes, I'm Frank from the halfway house. And I'm going, oh my gosh. And he's come to tell me he's just retired. He has been married to the same wife for, you know, all these years. He's, you know, does, did wonderful thing, nice right. grandchildren, and he wanted to thank me. Wow. And, That's got to make you feel good. You know, it, you, you find your purpose in life, and, and I believe it's to do good. Sure. Well, and I think often we do not um, pay enough attention to the impact, positive impact, we can have on other people in often minor, small ways, but it's very impactful for them. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. So, how did you get into law enforcement? <laughs> I was also, uh, I, yeah, I just let you know, I, was, I used to fight full contact uh, in martial arts. Right, right. And so, I, I did read, read about that on the Wikipedia page, and I, I, I tried to find a pronunciation of that particular strain of martial arts, and there wasn't one. So, please do educate us so on So, I did karate, judo, and, and jiu jitsu, and then, okay. but I, I Those I can say. But, what was but the other one? It, it's Kali. Kali. Yes. Okay. And so it's a Philippine martial arts. And okay. So we, uh, I fought full contact doing that. And so that's the direction I went into. In fact, it's a um, lot with uh, edge weapons, multiple attackers, and it's very dynamic art. What, what attracted you to that? Did you get your butt kicked one day or Actually, in uh, high school or something? No. Um, my <laughs> it's, it's weird because my, I wanted to play football. My parents won't let me play football. Uh. <laughs> I was fast. I was yeah, like, sure, sure. And I said, and they told me, he goes, you're going to get hurt uh -huh. you know, playing football. So, I, so you decided to learn how to kill people. <laughs> <Much alike. laughs> Do all that stuff. And I've got, uh, so yeah. But they were okay with you doing that? Yes. But or? as it turns out, they see, I was 
they put me in the karate, and then my father introduced me to this master in the Philippines with Philippine martial arts. Hmm. Because he said, look at this. Bruce Lee was, he showed Bruce Lee was doing something with two sticks, and, mm -hmm. and he goes, you know, that's Kali. That's Philippine martial arts. He goes, right. you should be proud of it. And I believe, you know, it's understanding your culture and heritage. Sure. It's important. Right. And so I said, hey, let me check that out. And then come to find out and go, well, if it's good enough for Bruce Lee, you know, I mean, I want to <laughs> check it out further. Right. And, and it turned out to be a wonderful thing. And it's now a very sought after uh, system, even from the standpoint of military training. It's right. remarkable. And, and it's the, the method of teaching is really the, the main thing for retention um, and also for execution of the technique. So rather than building like a building block, step one, step two, step three, you know, in a real fight, things change dramatically. So sure. Uh, sure. you train according to principles and angles and reaction and, and execution is faster. Right. Okay. okay. And yes. that led to law enforcement? Well, yes. Yeah, so, so long story short, I ended up in uh, West Texas and uh, I was you know, training up there with an instructor. Erwin, Big Spring is not some place you just randomly end up. So how, how, <laughs> did, how did you get there? My instructor okay. uh, ended up uh, moving to Big Spring, Texas because his wife was a nurse and there's a VA hospital in Big Spring. Uh, right. So I'm going, I just need an extra, you know, like training time with him. Mm -hmm. So end up going over there. And so uh, we went to a, uh, a Lions Club meeting while in Big Spring and they said, Erwin, we're going to do a martial arts demonstration for them. I said, cool, I'll do it. So we're fighting with sticks, throwing each other around. And the chief of police comes up to me and goes, Erwin, I said, how much would it cost for you to train my guys up in what you're doing? Oh, wow. And I said, you know, at the time I was young, I was cocky and, you know, just, you know. And so I said, chief, he said, it'd be cheaper for you just to hire me. <laughs> instead of that. Right. And then he goes, okay. And I said, and he, and I said, I was, I'm here only for vacation. I'm just joking, Chief. <laughs> I go back to Michigan, end up, uh, you know, that I, I assessed where I was at. It didn't work out, so I called the chief. I said, Chief, are you serious about hiring me? Yes, I am. Come down. The long story short. Okay. I, I came down. And then you eventually ended up at the Texas Department of Public Safety. Yes. So I was with Big Spring Police Department for a little bit, right. for about six years, and then and then end up uh, with DPS after that. So somehow, once you got to DPS, and you, you've done some amazing training of, of police officers across the country and internationally, correct? Yes, sir. So tell us about that. So um, like in law enforcement, what we do, uh, we influence a lot of people. And so we end up training people from the Philippines. Uh, people came in all the way from uh, Mexico. People came in from uh, Oh my gosh, so many different countries, you know, um, because you're, the principles that you're teaching, they're, they're looking for it to better their, their system. Mm -hmm. And so what I believe in is also developing relationships. So, and that's how I got to, to see, I want to see what they do in their country. I want to see what they do over here. I want to see what they do in Wisconsin. I want to see what they do in, in, um, in Massachusetts. So I got my friend uh, from Marty Michaelman from Boston and I got my friend from Bob Bragg from the Seattle or Seattle uh, Criminal Justice Training Center out of Seattle, Washington. So he's there, and so we talked about principles and process and procedures and so on. What's acceptable? What's not acceptable? We talked about the legal issues and so on. Right. And and so and I said, hey, we come to an understanding that, and in, in, in law enforcement, it's not all these you know fancy stuff that works. What well, we need to look at a, a decision making, uh, I would say platform. So we decided, we, we created one that's called, we have to have whatever technique we use for law enforcement has to be legally sound, mm -hmm. medically safe, tactically effective. Right. But there's so many things that are there, like, you know, that are tactically effective, but everybody you meet are blind and broken arm. You know, you can't do that. <laughs> so right. It has exactly. to be legally sound and medically safe. So, sure, sure. So, so we want to make sure that it's more professional. So it was nice by having this mixture and, and, and sharing, and I'm about, you know, collaboration with other people that, you know, uh, doing that. So with an educational background in psychology, sociology, where, where did de-escalation fit into the training? 
right? Because as a, as a law enforcement officer, oh. you're faced with situations that could very easily spiral into something where somebody ends up injured or dead, where there might very well be an option to de-escalate the tension and everybody I goes agree. home safe, right? I agree. You know, one of the number one things is that uh, we were taught at DPS is conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. The difference between interests, the difference between positions. And that's really key. Explain and, that. So sometimes what you'll do is say, hey, you know what? Um, let's say uh, you, you tell me uh, that you want an orange. Mm -hmm. and, and a friend of yours wants the orange too. And so the natural thing to do is to just split in half and, and this, you know, everybody should be happy, right? Sure. But it doesn't work that way. <laughs> right. So well, the thing is, come to find out, if I just visited with you, you wanted the, the peel so that you can make, use the rind for something. Cocktails. Or, <laughs> that's exactly it. I was thinking baking a cake or something. Oh, well, fine. We can bake a cake too, whatever. And, 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 then, and then your friend wanted it for the juice uh -huh. for his cocktail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what happened is that I made an immediate solution saying, hey, we'll just cut this in half. So the, the position that you had, what we're looking at is the orange, but the interests are different. Your interest was that mm -hmm. for the cocktail, the rind, and his is for the juice. Right. But if you understood it, both of you could have had your ways and not be a, a conflict. So understanding the difference between positions and interests is key. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I want to come back to your, your time at DPS. <laughs> no, no, that, I, I, that, that's, that's fascinating. I want to come back to DPS, but I also want to find out how you ended up at the FBI Academy. Oh, yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, so lucky. <laughs> so um, uh, the FBI, you know, at the FBI Academy, it's um, FBI National Academy. Okay. 1% of law enforcement in the world is invited there. So, you know, I, I feel if you think about that, you go, you know, another, another blessing. He said, this is a blessing. But at the same time, what they do is that people with potential to grow, to influence, you know, to be better, mm -hmm. to, to better the profession, I think that was the number one thing, too. Um, so you're, you're squared away there with people that are masters, has a master's degree. You're, you're there at University of Virginia. You're getting credits and so on. Oh, I was just so happy. I, I was just so happy to get a 4.0. <laughs> Well, that's impressive. in between everything else, you know, I'm going, oh, <laughs> but uh, I, I remember having to run at the end because you have to run like 10 miles. So one way is five miles and then the other one, five miles. And you're and in Quantico? Yeah, in Quantico. Okay. So you have all these things. You have to climb the rope. It's all, and, and my mindset, it's all mindset, by the way. Mm. It's how you take it. And it was sleeting. It was raining and sleeting and raining and snowing. So I was cold and muddy and I enjoyed it. <laughs> I well, enjoyed it. Mind over matter, right? I, no, I mean, it's not. I'm going and said, I was telling the guys, because isn't this great? This is great. So we're they like, they thought you were crazy. Yeah, yeah, but I enjoyed it. So, you know, we did it and then I get back. And then, um, but the thing is, is that positive? How, I mean, that's life the same way as life, right? So that's anyways, right. That's exactly so right. So we ended up um, developing longtime friends. And uh, in between while I was there, I was teaching also, uh, I, I, the defense tactics instructor that was there, we started working out, started picking my brain about certain things. And right. so they're remarkable guys. One, one of the guys I, I friended, his name was Bob, Baby, uh, Mark Babiak, Mark, and then Ed Dare. And um, they're both defensive tactics experts, black belts in jiu-jitsu and so mm -hmm. on. And um, so during the time while I was there, I was teaching them knife tactics. And uh, they asked me, they go, said, Erwin, uh, how do you test people? And he says, I said, <laughs> well, I said, tomorrow I'll test you. So I took a knife from the kitchen and brought it with me to the office. <laughs> okay. How'd that turn out? Well, I didn't trust him, so I put, <laughs> so I put <laughs> tape on the edge. The point's okay. I could control the point, right. the edge, but so he doesn't know it's that sharp. Huh. So I was cutting at him dynamic, no patterns, and he was right. defending against it. And did I a said, good job? I said, yep, no cuts. I said, <laughs> I said Mark, <laughs> you passed. <laughs> so, but that's how, that's, you know, but it was friendship and, you know, I mean, you know, belt ranking doesn't mean anything if you can't 
handle yourself anyway. So. Sure, that's true. Now, you were, you were telling me, going back to your time uh, at DPS, at some point you were on the governor's protective detail, and, and you, you wrecked Governor Ann Richards' car. Why did you do that? Uh, <laughs> you had to go there. No, no. Wonderful lady, wonderful woman. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> we were going to actually eat dinner, and um, we were going to go to Westland Cafe, and... You know, she instructed me to go into an alleyway where it was just too tight. And I went in there. I knew better. Right. But I, I went in there anyway. And, and um, as I was scraping the side of the <laughs> building going around there, she actually said this. I mean, it was kind of funny now, but not funny then. Sure. Because she goes, oh, Irwin, you're in trouble now. <laughs> I don't know if you can visualize that. Oh, I can that. hear you it. Can, you can I hear can it. Hear it. Can sure, it. sure. And, uh, oh, my gosh. You know, <laughs> and there were other dignitaries in the car, correct? Uh, people from Washington, D.C. were there. And, they were like, <laughs> and my partner was like, kind of look. I could see he's looking at me. And, and I think the cushion seat was like sucking up, you know, <laughs> my butt. You know, he's like crazy, right? So... But she goes, eventually, she goes, Erwin, just park where you want to park. <laughs> <laughs> so, she, she decided to leave it up to you. Yeah, and so I ended up parking where originally I, where I wanted to park. Okay. But it was okay. But the car's all scraped up. Scraped right? up on the side. And so she goes, okay, you guys go on in. The funny part is that the doors open, which is good. <laughs> it's <That laughs> great, but the that doors open. So, so despite that incident, it, it, you didn't get fired or anything, and you went on no. to, to also be on Governor Bush's detail. Yes, right? but let me, let me tell you one thing, though. I want to tell you something. that yeah. What she did tell me, I, I, I think it was very soft-hearted. I mean, that was really nice. Because, she, well, she told everybody to go in. She told me, she goes, you know, Erwin, we can replace that car. Don't worry about it. We can't replace people like you. That really touched me. Yeah. I mean, that was very touching. Absolutely. So, Gov Governor Bush, any good stories on him? Oh, my God. <laughs> <clears throat> a wonderful person, wonderful man, um, very accommodating. Uh, I remember we were having, uh, uh, he allowed me to, to show a friend of mine from Washington State, Bob Bragg, from Seattle uh, Criminal Justice Training Center there to give a tour at the, at the governor's mansion. and. Mm -hmm. He had these guys he's going to meet with, and he's, he comes down, and he's making putter, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Nice. And so while he's doing that, <laughs> peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and he's, 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 he's doing that. And, um, was it grape jelly, orange marmalade? You know, I think it was grape. I, <laughs> okay. But I don't know. I'm just kidding. I don't know. I couldn't remember. But <laughs> Details. But details. the fact that he, he was willing to roll his sleeve up, make his own sandwich, mm -hmm. And visit with you and your friend. Right. I mean, um, it's an what a guy. nice, what a nice, very personable and visit. And then eventually he goes, oh, I forgot I got these other guys. I'm, I, I got to take care of them. I'll catch you later. <laughs> and I'm going like, like I said, we're like friends. I'm going. Well, he is a he 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 is a very loving person. Right. So. There's no doubt about it. No doubt. And, and and that the relationship that developed between you and him at that time eventually led to you having dinner with him in the White House at a later point. Is that right? Later point actually all I wanted was um, a tour. <laughs> you just wanted a coffee mug and you ended up having dinner with the president. And actually coming Life's back awful, in the evening. It, <laughs> yeah, we ended up coming back in the evening and uh, and it was a cool thing, you know, and um, he actually the, the the fact that he took his time to show us the rose garden, you know, and that he took his time to show, you know, his plans for the carpet. And he actually, imagine this, this is before 9-11. Right. You know, the desk there where the eagle mm -hmm. with the arrows on one end and then uh, is it the olive on one end. Right. And then the eagle's head was torn towards the 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 uh, the arrows, right? Right. Because at the time we were at war. He made a, a special thing to tell me. He goes, you know, Erwin, my administration, I want to focus on uniting us. I said, oh, wow, this is great. And, you know, that he's, he's just telling us how he wanted to, to unite mm -hmm. the country. Right. And, um, and I remember we, we had actually talked about Abraham Lincoln. And I, I gave him a, he sent me a letter after, I gave him a coin with Abraham Lincoln on it. And, and so he was, he was touched, apparently, and so he wrote me a little letter. So in, in that, that dinner at the White House was pre-9-11, right? Mm -hmm. And so post-9-11, you got called by the White House and asked to, 
to be a liaison with, with the Philippines, right? No, actually, the White House didn't call me. So what happened was that um, I found out that the Philippine government um, emailed, actually, they first emailed, said, hey, Erwin, 9-11 just happened. Uh, this uh, individual, I don't even know who he was, says, we would like to um, um, invite you to Washington, D.C. to be a liaison between the Philippine government and, and the U.S. government. And I said, who is this? I didn't know <laughs> it was. And, and so that's when the, it turned out it was the Philippine government. And so they, they must have, you know, said, hey, the, one of the guards is Philippine descent. And so, so President Lodori of the Philippines was one of the first president to, after 9-11, to call President Bush saying, we support you, we, we're there for you, whatever you need, and so on. Right. And so now they started their planning on the meeting. And that would happen in November. So September, October, November. Very fast, just to do that. And so November, I was back in Washington, D.C. And so I don't know what even my role was. <laughs> I have no idea. You so showed actually, up. I called up people in Washington, D.C., and they said, Erwin, you're a civilian. We can't tell you what to do. Huh. So I said, I don't know. Am I doing the right thing? Maybe I just back off. And he goes, and um, somebody called me one time and goes, just let you know, Erwin, we just think that what, whatever you are, you're, you're a patriot. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. going to do what I'm going to do. So, right. so I ended up going there. And, and um, so this is where I met President Royo of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Actually, we had dinner ahead of time the night before. And so I brought my friend who was an FBI agent, Mark Babiak, and met with Ambassador de Losario, met with all their staff. The, the ambassador to the UN. From the Philippines. From the Philippines. Right. All the Philippine group. And, and so, exchange cards and so on. And, and uh, they're telling me what they're going to ask him. They're going to talk. And, you know, I said, oh, great. And I don't know anything about diplomacy. Right. But I and so what are you going to tell the president of the Philippines? And I said, I believe we should focus on our longstanding history of friendship from pre-World War II World War II and then now with all the things that are happening that we are going to work together. Uh, we focus on generality and we're not going to focus on specifics. Right. I think we'll be good. Sure. I said, that sounds good. So, <laughs> I have no idea what I just did. And it I all just worked said, out. But it all worked out. So. That's good. <laughs> so, uh, you know, given all of, things, all of things that you've done in your life and the positive impact that you've had on different people and, and we talked about finding God's purpose in your life, but... Um, something that has to rank pretty high up there in your mind as far as accomplishments in your life is you have two very amazing sons. Uh, tell us about what they're up to these days. Yeah, you know, um, it, I believe it's not about me. It's about the things that you, you know, accomplish. And, um, you know, whenever you meet people, I mean, I'm just proud of even meeting the state troopers out here. Right. I'm just so proud of them, what they've accomplished. And if, I feel like they're my babies, too. But uh, these two wonderful boys, uh, the older boy, at, <clears throat> he, at 17, he decided he wanted to give a life of service. He, um, he uh, applied at West Point. He got accepted at West Point. Before that, he spoke Russian. Pflugerville High School is a wonderful school. Right. Yes. So, um, he's, and who would have thought they teach Russian? Russian studies. Yeah, okay. But somebody in Florida. Big them. Russian population no, in Pflugerville. Yes. <laughs> Pflugerville. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. But anyway, so it ended up, uh, ended up um, you know, getting accepted. And then when he went to uh, West Point, he uh, studied Chinese, Chinese history. He learned how to speak, read, and write Chinese. Wow. And he's also, of course, he's a very quiet person. More of, I didn't realize he was also a computer engineer. So, I mean, so, so Why not throw Michael. that on top of there, huh? But uh, his last deployment, um, he, uh, he actually... Uh, he was involved in an eight-hour running gun battle, eight hours of running gun battle. Mm. And um, he told me um, whenever he was able to muster up to be able to talk to me, uh, he said, Dad, you know, uh, Humvee was burning everywhere. We're outside. They're walking in mortars. They're going to kill us. And uh, our motor chief got, you know, we told him to do a counter motor strike, and then he gets hit. You know, everybody's, like, hiding behind a rock. And this is where you go the person comes out in you when right. bad things happen. He sure. goes, Dad, I just don't want to die behind a rock, and I just don't want to die not doing anything. Mm -hmm. 
So this is, I decided I'm going to go do what I can to save my men. So he lightened up his, his gear because he felt that he goes, it's just too heavy. Sure. So he lightened it up, had his rifle, rushed out there. And this is according to some of his friends that told him, he goes, so Mr. Ballard, I says, bullets were hitting all around him. RPGs whizzing by. And next thing you know, you know, Dashiell takes the mortar himself and line of sight, takes out enemy placement by himself. And then while he's tending to the wounded and helping everything else, we're starting to come down. Again, we've got a second uh, ambush. So now he's having now direct airstrike directly to take them all out. So, so he, he as, a, as a second lieutenant at the time, he did a wonderful thing. You sure, know? So and saved a lot of lives. Saved a lot of lives. Right. So, you know, you look at that, you go, character comes out. And I believe that's, um, that's all I can, when I raised my children, it says, you know, I didn't, I didn't try to, focus too much on accomplishments. I, I like accomplishments, but sure. we emphasize character, ethics, good values, and so on. And, and, uh, and, and we, that's how we lived our life. Right. So. And so your other son has been very successful in business is, and, and is now giving back in some pretty significant ways. Yes. Uh, we're really proud of him. Uh, his uh, last project, he was one of the three guys that founded Life Proof Cases. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Gary Rayner is the CEO. And um, it was so, it's, it's so welcoming to, and, and, and a blessing to have him bring Kyle in. And I remember Kyle was telling me, he goes, yeah, Dad, because uh, uh, his story is really remarkable, too, because his lung collapsed. He was a trumpet player, and uh, he was at a music conservatory. And he Just was playing too hard? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and, and imagine that he got a letter of recommendation from Robin Williams to go to Juilliard. Oh, wow. Oh, it's just, I mean, he, his life was was graced and uh, he wrote music he plays the piano he plays the trumpet he writes he was sponsored already by scion a car company mm -hmm. and then he lungs his lung collapse mm. and you know your life you know right and you, so you think it's off track it's off track all right he prayed and went forward and so i said god tell me what direction i should go mm -hmm. and so he decided and you know with to um to take up the MBA program at uh, St. Ed's, wonderful program, right? And uh, on digital media management, MBA, oh, wow. it's just remarkable. It's either that or Paris, France. We couldn't afford Paris, France. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know. So he ends up over there. But um, so while he's there, my friend Gary's launching this company or about to, mm -hmm. and so he used Kyle. Can I use Kyle? And so, and so Kyle was telling me, he goes, yeah, Dad, I learned how to pitch. Um, Last week, but the week before, I was pitching already. We got like like money to fund our stuff. Oh wow! So he was already doing the things. It was a natural, right? natural. And so, in it, it, the growth was a hockey stick approach. In right. Two and three years, they sold it for ungodly amount. But one thing is that um, again, the character comes out. Mm -hmm. What do you do with the money? What do you do with the blessings? You go buy a Porsche. He he almost did. He actually <laughs> we rode around testing a Porsche Panamera. I didn't realize how technical they are. And you, can't, right. you don't realize how fast you're really going. No. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And, but anyway, so we're driving. Even in a four-door Porsche. Oh, it was yeah. a four-door, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was like, but I didn't realize how technical it is, but it's just a wonderful vehicle. But then he tells me, he goes, you know, Dad, uh, I just cannot, uh, you know, justify this. And so he did. He started a scholarship fund for homeless children. And, and so, you know, helping people. He's uh, actually, he's, uh, he's on the board for the Mexican-American uh, Business Alliance here, you know, as well. Right. Uh, so he's on the board for that. He's on the board with, uh, I don't know, with several different nonprofits and with uh, Andy Roddick Foundation. He's mm -hmm. also on the board for that. Right. Um, so, I mean, he's, he's helping out in different ways. But next year, he's, he'll be the first non-Hispanic, well, I guess we can be considered Hispanic, Bayarta or Balarda. <laughs> That's <laughs> how you want to pronounce it, all right? So if you could go by German or, or, or Hispanic, but he'll be one of the first presidents, president for the Mexican-American Business Alliance. And he's not even, yeah. Can you imagine? Think about that. That's huge. All right, so that is huge. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody asked for your Ancestry.com uh, no. paperwork or anything? But you know, I guarantee you, though, we do have Hispanic blood in us. Okay. You know, Philippines, so right. we're all good. Right. So. Well, the, it's it's amazing what what they're doing, and and certainly you, you, there's a lot to be proud of uh, in that. Um, 
You know, moving moving forward with your company, I mean, we know we live in a dangerous world, right? I, I, the, the president of my college where I went to undergrad was a former director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Mm -hmm. He was deputy director of the CIA under H.W. Oh. Bush. And I remember him saying to us one day in a seminar class he taught, the world is immensely more dangerous than you will ever know. And our job was to make sure you don't know how dangerous it is. But we live in a dangerous world and we live, you know, at times, especially today with smartphones and technology, everybody walks around with their face and their smartphone, even if it's midnight and they're walking downtown, which I can't imagine is smart. So what do you teach people about situational awareness? I, I think this, the number one thing in any kind of security related, um, I, if I was to remind or give a, uh, a tip is to have actually that sexual awareness. You know, when you're, when you're walking, when you're walking, you've got to know where you're walking. Stop mm. that texting. Right. You know, in fact, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, uh, people prey on people when they know that they're going to be e an easy prey. Not paying attention. Not paying attention. You know, one thing is that we cannot determine what a bad guy is, is going to do. We cannot determine what a bad guy is going to think. We cannot mm -hmm. determine all his planning. He can plan all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know what we have? We can determine how we react to that, how we can plan, how we can deter, and make us look like a safer target. If we look like a harder target, right. safer, they'll go somewhere else. Right. And so on the other end, we can control the situation or maybe perhaps they won't make a decision on that, mm -hmm. not to do that. Sure. So that's one aspect is to prevent it from occurring by having those situational awareness. Right. You know, the different mindsets and, and uh, you know, again, not just the physical. When you get to the physical, you, you, you're already, you know, you're done. You probably should have done a lot of preparation before that. Yeah, unless point. you've had some training. Unless you have the training. Right. So there's been a lot of, a lot of um, talk in the news lately. <clears throat> it seems like, unfortunately, in this modern era in which we live, mm -hmm. there, there, there are way too many. One's, one's too many, uh, and now we've seen multiple school shootings. So, so given what you do at Armatech, what, what thoughts do you have on how we go about making our schools safer? Here's the key thing. Let's, let's take away the politics. Right. And if you were to look at anything that you need to make safe, let's say right now <clears throat> we don't allow grenades and guns on planes. Mm -hmm. That's probably a good rule. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we don't allow you to carry guns inside a bank. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, openly saying, hey, you know, that's... what we do is that those particular areas we do to make is to deter. So bad guys can plan to kill. Bad guys can that's use right. a truck. Bad guys can use a knife. Bad guys can use a gun. It's a soft target. You look for the soft targets. Right. So the bad guys will focus on things that their whatever they execute, their success rate, probability of success is greater. And, and probability of uh, getting away is greater, mm -hmm. and, and so on and so on. So they, they do that on a planning stage. But even on an emotional aspect, even if it's an emotional situation, they'll do that, and they said, but if they see something stronger that would deter them, that's important. So, so you look at this, because how can we deter these things from occurring in schools? Right. So one aspect is that, why can't we even have just procedures? Procedures. It shouldn't be that hard. It shouldn't be that hard. So right. having a procedure to have a procedural plan on how, let's say, where the children are going to go from here to here. Eighth graders come to school at this time. You know, sixth graders come at this time or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. But you create a procedure. And then for security personnel located location, they know that everybody's going to come here. Nobody's going to come to the back. Right. Um, one aspect is that, you know, one look, just think. I was thinking about this because you were looking at that. And why can't we have surveillance cameras on those, on those facilities? I'm just saying. I would suspect most people think we already do. But, huh? yes. But, but we don't. Yes. But can you imagine, let's say, what, what I, I, I'm envisioning. Look at this. We can have security companies that are manned by disabled vets. Disabled vets mm -hmm. that can man cameras at our, and, and they can make, make Command, like uh, call the right people at certain times and so on. Sure. So at least it's on a continuous basis. And we have vets who are disabled 
and we can they want to be useful they want to be so they can bring them back to the team part of the team right. in fact my company is going to be we're hi, we're at 95% hiring disabled vets oh wow did you yes. know that? no the i did majority not majority of my my personnel are vets that's impressive uh, you know it's just remarkable but uh, but anyways on the other end on surveillance aspect would be great even if they're on wheelchairs whatever but right. they're attentive they have the frame of mind they have that mindset they have security clearances Right. I think that would be wonderful, creating a s series of pro process and procedure, utilizing the surveillance aspect. And you know those little, um, uh, let's say you want to order, you know those little things that you order from Amazon, you know, you want to order some more um, uh, oh, yeah. soap or whatever. Right. But you know, you the can, easy button, that's easy not button. what they call it, but yeah. But you know what I'm talking about. Sure. But you know, you can reprogram them, it's like one, two, three means something else. And, and mm -hmm. actually, that's like less than five bucks. Every teacher could have something like that, sure, and and just tell you if you, the third hit means something's going on, right? And and an alarm system then it could be to a centralized area. Mm -hmm. But process and procedure is number one thing, um, you know. Um, but I think making the area a hard target, like yes. I was saying the earlier part on self defense, you gotta take. They'll, they'll plan all their time, all they want to do, whether they want to use a gun, a bomb, a car, whatever, right. It's the opportunity that you you make it a harder target. That's Process, right. procedure, um, you know, quick fixes, maybe structural changes. Well, and and uh, I mean, there's obviously the aspect of mental illness, and with these you know young people who are, are doing these ba bad and awful things, um, probably a because of a cry as a cry for help, right? Yes. Uh, but regardless uh, of the motives. It's always uh, easy to pick on a gun-free zone, which we've made our schools. So there's also the debate of, of arming teachers. I mean, should we allow a teacher with proper training to have a concealed handgun in mm -hmm. the classroom? Yeah, I mean, that's a wonderful debate. Um, but I believe, you know, I mean, having trained personnel, I think it, it's mm -hmm. not far-fetched that they, you know, they have trained personnel. Unfortunately, sure. they're using people that are almost near retirement as police officers to be in schools. Right. And, and I'm telling you, you know, we're, we, this is the most valuable assets we have are our children. Mm -hmm. And we don't put the effort to give them the best security. Right. We'll put that security in the bank right. that's insured. Right. <laughs> but we won't put that in schools. So it's just me. I mean, I'm not preaching. You know, I'm just saying you, you look at the comparison, the value I value my children. I have grandchildren, right? And I value my grandchildren um, tremendously, and I don't want to see that happen. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, hopefully, it's a problem that uh, we can find a solution to. Mm -hmm. So, um, if if our listeners are are, are are listening to your story today and want to learn more about Armatech and the things that you do, where can they find you? Uh, we, they can find me at uh, ArmatechSecurity.com. A R M A T E K. Okay. Arma is derivative of defense, self defense, and tech technology. So, very good. That's what very good. Well, Mr. Erwin Balarta. That's right. You pronounce it well, Trey. Yeah, you know, I, that's a great thing. I mean, you can you can be Filipino one day and Hispanic the other day, right? Just depending on how you how you feel when you that's wake exactly, up. Exactly. Or or I could be partially German I and guess, partially Irwin. German because of the Erwin. I like it. Well, thank you for taking the time to come on the Trey Blocker Show. It's been well, it's, an it's enjoyable so nice. conversation. Trey. Absolutely, and I hope you'll come back sometime. We will. So thank you all for tuning in to the Trey Blocker Show. You can find us at TreyBlocker.com on iTunes, YouTube, and your other favorite podcast apps. Thanks and God bless. This has been the Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.